So can AI actually be used to figure out the best economic tax policy? We'll take a look at this paper from Salesforce Research and Harvard University in order to find out. So to start off, I'll talk about what's sort of been the theorized as one of the trade-offs between taxation, uh, which is higher taxation. Well, they say from the paper from this quote is, while more taxation can improve equality, taxation can also discourage people from working. And so the idea, the objective function at the end of this at the end of this uh, paper is just learn this uh, optimal tax schedule. And so an example of a tax schedule, this is from the 2020 uh, U.S. tax schedule for individual taxpayers. And essentially, you're just broken off into different brackets. And depending on how much money you make, you pay a certain amount back differently based on how much money uh, you make. And that's essentially a tax schedule. So we, what we want to do is essentially find out what are the best boundaries for each of these points. Uh, what, what do we call a bracket and also what how much of that is actually paid. Um, and so we'll see how they use artificial intelligence, machine learning and big data uh, to actually accomplish this and figure out the best optimal tax schedule. So this is a two agent problem. So what they're going to go over discussing is they're essentially making uh, kind of two reinforcement learning algorithms within each other. Uh, the first reinforcement learning algorithm is, is involving given a policy and given these individual behaviors, they have a sort of game and that all these individual players will learn the best, uh, you know, the best behaviors that they can have in order to optimize uh, their labor and utility. And but then in addition, so that if they were just the, the agents learning, you know, how to best behave under a given a single tax policy, uh, this would be an example of a one agent problem because the only thing you need to do is really model how the person would respond into, into, with this uh, tax problem, uh, with this tax policy. But with this two agent problem, we're now learning, looking at two different behaviors learned. We're looking at the policy is being learned simultaneously with the individual behaviors. And so this will actually let us get a dynamic system where we're able to actually uh, use things. And we'll go a little bit more into this, but they are able to show that things like tax avoidance and specialization or division of labor, um, you can kind of, we, we can learn policies that actually do incorporate these sorts of uh, natural economic behaviors and actually learn optimal ways uh, to deal with these tax brackets from that way. So um, this is just an overview of their sort of bigger network. And essentially they have this public map, which is where they're essentially the one the first loop of this reinforcement learning algorithm is learning how these individual actors can respond and, and gather resources on the sort of game like structure which we'll talk more about in a second and so for these individual agents they'll have a cnn that goes through the public map the actual map um, and then they have a multi-layer perception which it kind of incorporates uh private states their endowment which is their essentially their past their history of past earnings um, and then also tax rates and market behavior. Uh, these will feed into an LSTM to another multi perceptron, and then essentially we'll get out what the agent should do. So every, you know, you can either move to a square, you can build something on that square, or you can uh, trade uh, some given objects. And uh, that's so that's like uh, if we were just doing that that would just be sort of the one agent problem but we're doing the two agent learning problem so we're also learning a planner model which also takes into account the spatial information from the public map using a convolutional neural network um, and then uses multi-layer perceptrons here and uh, lstm to actually identify and set the given tax brackets and how much that they should owe uh, for each of those individual brackets so we see that we learn both the agent action and the planner action simultaneously. That's kind of the key and really interesting step here and why they're able to make this sort of a deep reinforcement learning algorithm because they, they're learning both of these uh, complex behaviors kind of at once and simultaneously. And so it makes it really kind of interesting. So to talk a little bit about this paper, you really need to kind of understand at least the framework of uh, these multi-agent Markov games. So just like we were talking about uh, multi-agent, you know, having multiple different objectives, multiple different sort of uh, uh, sorts of groups, which would be, in this case would be like the individual taxpayers and also the government paying the tax policy. Um, and so for each of these, uh, if you think about where we're able to find this, we're essentially able to define a series of states and a series of action. Um, and so we can, you know, at, at a given action, and they can, they have different kinds of actions for this game. So it might just go a little bit more into this uh, right here. So basically, this is like an, an overall map of this game. This is kind of just an artistic description, but this is actually what the the seed that they use for their map. And essentially, it's a very similar to other sort of uh, very looks similar to kind of other resource intensive games. If you ever played any, it's kind of what they call the gather and build games. They say agents move around, collect resources like wood and stone, and build houses. Agents cannot move through each other's houses or move through water, and agents can trade resources. 
And so basically, there are certain squares that these resources, which are stone and wood, will actually spawn on, and they have like finite use, so you can walk on them and you'll get some back, but only a certain amount of people can use them at once, or use them over time, and then they deplete, and they take time to come back. Um, but you can combine one stone and one wood to get a house, and a house will give you money. Uh, the amount of money that your that your house will give you depends on your skill level, which is also randomly distributed. So there are some people um, that you know you, if you're really good at building a house. And I think this this next graph kind of shows that um, a little bit. I have myself that's okay. Uh, so basically, you can see how um, we're able to the people with higher skills uh, tend to build more houses because they get more money per house, uh, while the people with lower skills tend not to. So in the no tax case, uh, we actually get we can actually see that like uh this is an example of of over time so this is a start this is like the second time point second, third time point fourth time point and we see that uh, the agent one that has a high skill of building houses and these are all like automatic robots or whatever uh, you know just automated algorithms uh, they've decided to build a bunch of houses and we actually do see this is it's really interesting because we kind of see this uh, division of labor specialization uh, kind of from like adam smith's terminology in the wealth of the nations but essentially uh this idea that people kind of go to where they're good at. This is an example of what they've traded at the very last row. And so we can see that agent one didn't really trade anything. They just ended up buying this. If it's on the other side, it means that they're buying all these supplies. Uh, that's because they get more money from just building the houses. So they just want to buy the supplies while the other uh, people who aren't as good at building houses will actually uh, focus their time trading. And so we see specialization that this person is focused on. I think this is one the green would be, uh, I guess, wood and orange would be stone. And so we see one of the, the lower skilled people focusing on getting the wood and one of the lower skilled people focusing on getting the stone. Um, and so, and we also see that somebody who does have a decent skill uh, with, um, you know, building houses does still build a few houses here and there. So it's actually kind of, everybody kind of is working towards their uh, own sort of what they're good at and what kind of utilities them. And that's sort of just the introduction to the sort of gamified economy that they created. So this is just a brief overview of the exact uh, sort of variables that they're interested in defining. And so all these things that we had kind of talked about, we have a time state T, uh, we have different indices, model weights, a uh, state, which is just kind of the given game, the board uh, at any given time, uh, the observation, which is sort of the set of, op of actions, the action to take, which would be the predicted action to take, the reward for that action for each individual actor, um, pi is representing the policy, uh, you have the discount factor gamma, which again, it, it's kind of, it is forward looking. So keep in mind, this game is sort of forward looking in that it, it will calculate how much you expect to earn in the future. And so if you have the discounted rate, and it'll, it'll discount that by seven, because we know that, you know, you, if you had a dollar today, it would be better than a dollar next year. And this is top, sort of time value of money. And so this is a way of kind of incorporating that. Um, and so we have, you know, head and straight transitions, dynamics. Uh, different sorts of resources, tax rates, planner policy. We'll go a little bit more into all of these uh, right now. And so the first thing, so this is this sort of what they're uh, describing as sort of the objective function for a individual taxpayer, individual actor, uh, the individual. Uh, so this is partially observable. In other words, we can't really, we don't know what all the other individuals are doing. We don't know, um, you know, how much time they're spending building houses or how much time they're spending trading or whatever. Um, but we do know what ourselves is. So essentially, uh, what, what the action that we make, and so this is going reading from left to right, is this action get with respect to this policy. We want to figure out the action with respect to the policy, take into account the A minus one, which is the action of all other taxpayers. And then uh, that's not you. Essentially saying, well, take into account what everybody else is doing and what the state is. So this is that S prime to T this is that state transitions that would happen. So that would take into account all of these things. What is the actual, uh, you know, and we want to maximize this discounted again, with this discounted return uh, rate. And so that's how we kind of like frame this in sort of the artificial intelligence sort of framework. Um, and so given if you yeah, see the policy, we have a policy and uh, a policy without us, which is I, the individual actor. Um, in this case, so again, yeah, we just calculate it based on what everybody else is doing. Um, our, our action is based on what everybody else is doing, what the policy is without us, and what the state would be. Um, and so next, and actually, in order to uh, kind of complete this, we need to define a utility function. And so this is, if you're familiar with this economically, um, but basically it's this idea that um, you need to kind of define, you need to figure out a way. We, we have two kind of units. We have labor and money and cost. And so we need to kind of, kind of figure out a way to relate those two things together. 
And so we kind of say the utility of both of these is some function of both of these. Um, the CRA is a kind of uh, a, fun a transformation that kind of allows us to grow in perpetuity kind of models. Uh, it's just kind of what we've seen realistically that models economic behavior. Uh, but basically we can define a utility function in terms of the amount of labor spent. And this, so this is uh, important to know that this is actually um, cumulative labor. So this will actually be all the labor up until that point you don't want to spend you don't want to work you know i guess super hard forever right so you, you just work for a finite amount of time and then they, they all that cumulative you take all that into account when you're trying to figure out your own utility um and so you can see that uh if you have everything else equal with only the, they just kind of did this just to show if you have everything else equal and only the skill uh difference in building houses we get a lot better utility graph because you know we, we, we can just build a bunch of houses for a lot of money and it's a lot easier um but we all rest on this utility graph, um, in which case that, you know, it may not be worth this guy to build any houses versus uh, the highest skilled one. And so this is just an expansion of this uh, same sort of formula. This is actually very similar to what we had just uh, stuck out. This is now substituting our utility function uh, for our return, though. So essentially, instead of saying we're, we want to maximize the expected uti return, we want to now maximize the expected utility um and so this is a previous graph that that was just done with no taxes and so this is kind of um really not this is kind of i guess what they call they do call this kind of free market and where there's no taxes involved um we see that the agent one will just make one houses again um and they, there we do see some kind of like fundamental economic behavior like a uh, division of labor and so then they introduce tax brackets. I'm not going to go too much into the math of this um, because you can go into it kind of yourself. If you're really, really interested. But the idea is essentially we yeah, we have certain, you know, this identity function. So it's like we have, if you're between, it's the same mathematical way equivalent. If you're between, you know, this income and this income, you'll pay this tax here. And then we can model like this, the sort of total thing that you pay or sort of, yeah, uh, as being what you made before minus your tax breaks, essentially. Um, and so... Once they actually uh, look at this, if you look at sort of what this is the depictions that they had done after they had, you know, figure out the best sort of models. And so they're, they're basically, they're trying to compare this to just a free market model, which would be, you know, no taxes, the current US federal model, um, which is similar to what we had shown before, uh, the SAIS model, which is actually um, a kind of newer, it's kind of the, the more theoretically you know, derived economics models. I, I honestly don't know too much about it, but it is just another one that they did compare it to. Um, but the, the idea is that essentially up until this point, we have been talking about the perspective from the actor side, but now we actually want to discuss the perspective from the policymaker side, from the government side. And when you think about what the role of taxes are, we essentially want to need to define some social welfare function, which they call SWF. And it's essentially a function of the ego, uh, the, the equity and the productivity, right? Because we want to maximize this equity and productivity trade-off. Um, and so training this planner will actually, um, because this planner, again, is partially observable, so it won't actually observe any of the individual states of, of the, it won't observe, you know, how much somebody's working, it won't observe uh, in the individual levels, uh, and it does not personalize these taxes. So just like the U.S. tax policy, it has a single sort of set tax schedule for all people that are, that are paying taxes. Um, and they do talk a little bit about it, so they just kind of use a very so, uh, simple social welfare function here. And I think there's been a lot of kind of work that's been done on sort of, you can you can have ones that actually are utilitarian, that just kind of maximize the sum of all the utility, or the Rawlsian perspective, which would focus on the poorest agent, or you could have some sort of inverse income weighted. And so they just focus on the social welfare function uh, that has, you know, essentially just... Uh, it, it, like just overall equ equity and productivity maximization. Um, but they do talk about how this sort of framework can actually work with a lot of other, um, you know, other social welfare functions. So this is sort of the two level um, reinforcement learning sort of uh, so this is the two level reinforcement learning, the deep reinforcement learning that they're talking about. And so we have this inner loop here, which actually is the participant slash the AI players. And so this will learn the optimal behavior and then it'll, it'll um, buy and sell things. And so they did this, and I probably should mention this now, is that they did this with a lot of robots over you know a large amount of samples. And they also did do this through with uh, real players. Um, and so they talk about the kind of differences about that in a little bit more in a second. But right now, I just want to get at the, the fact that they're learning sort of this behavior. And then also this AI economist actually observes, you know, what's going on with this inner loop. 
and then we'll actually learn the optimal tax policy uh, to go. So it's really kind of, uh, I think, very elegant, this this two-level reinforcement learning. So in the, again, it says in the, in the inner loop, reinforcement learning agents gain experience by performing later receiving income and paying taxes and learn through balancing exploration exploitation how to adapt their behavior and maximize their utility and the outer loop the social planner adapts tax policies to maximize its social objective and so this is just like a kind of depiction that they had of a of an actual real world player had the sort of a uh, graphical interface that, that a real world player would have and as you can see this is the exact same c that they had before so one of my criticisms is I literally just did it all in one seed and I don't know, maybe I'm just a nerd, so I play too much like civilization and stuff, but the the idea of this initial map kind of becomes very important. I could see how that could change a lot of things. Uh, I'd like to see some studies on scarcity and that sort of stuff, but, um, and so they, they do compare some of uh, the differences between the U.S. federal, the sales formula, and the A economist. And so just as a, as a visual depiction, I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, so the U.S. federal policy will generally just upgrade the, the amount of tax you pay uh, based on how much you make. Uh, the sales formula has a, has kind of a little bit different. It has a lot of taxes for the people who aren't making too much money. And keep in mind that they would get, like, the, the idea is that they would get redistributed back from people who did make more money. Um, and then the kind of lesser and sort of a um, um, regressive tax almost, or progressive tax. Uh, but then this this is, AI hey, economists is honestly kind of like a mixture of both. I think it's really interesting that some parts, some people you know, end up paying a lot, especially that there's not really linearly... Um, you know, equal. It's kind of it. It is kind of interesting in that way. And so I should also keep in mind that they did tie these amounts back. They kind of did it, and and they had like one to one thousand possible coins or something like that. If you made anything above it, so they kind of framed it in a way that it was very uh, similar to the distribution in the actual uh, population, and also the way that they did these these tax policies anyway. Um, and so we see that uh, they they actually, you know, by a lot of the different ways they measured it, their AI economic, economists actually ended up outperforming a lot of the other um, sort of uh, policy, especially by this equality uh, productivity trade-off and this income, income inverse income weighted utility. And so they also did put this in bold, so I thought I mentioned this too, that they, they, they do not endorse this for a particular tax schedule determined by the AI economists for use in the real economy. And I think that they know it's, it's a little bit too simplistic, but I, still, I think it's, it's a really interesting paper. And the reason I'm talking about it is because um, I think a lot of these sort of theories and sort of the thoughts behind this could be used. And, and I know it seems very simplistic and kind of like a video game right now almost. I mean, it really is, right? But uh, I think that... In, in the future, we can kind of use these sort of real experiments like this, and then um, I, th I really kind of been optimistic, and I would like to honestly see a little bit more work into, uh, you know, really just determine economic policy based on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and so again, we saw things like realistic behavior that they would do things like tax avoidance and specialization, um, and also the humans. So the, one of the problems that they did mention was that humans would do things that were kind of, I guess, rude to other players. So they would like block them off and like stop them from getting resources and stuff, which what the, the AIs didn't do. Um, but it, so it is kind of interesting that these people do interact in different ways. But I think that even given that, you could still kind of understand this in the machine learning framework to understand how to get the best policies uh, for taxes and that sort of thing. So thank you all very much for joining. Thank you all for watching. Make sure you smash that like button, hit that subscribe, leave a comment if you want me to go over anything. Really appreciate you watching. Thanks. Bye.